This is Twit. Magic Leap continues to be the biggest budget reality warping gadget that no one has ever actually played with, outside of those who work on it within the company, of course. We're almost four years into the saga of Magic Leap, and though we know what it's supposedly capable of and we know more about the hardware, it's still a device that's shrouded in mystery. Can it even possibly live up to four years of hype? Joining us to give his take is Sean Hollister from CNET. Welcome back to the show, Sean. Thanks so much for having me, Jason. <laughs> it's great to get you here, man. So uh, Magic Leap has the trickle approach uh, when it comes to promoting its hardware, it seems. They broadcast uh, an hour-long live stream on Twitch just this week. Maybe that was yesterday or the day before. Shared new details about the hardware. What's some of the new information that we can actually get excited about? Well, the big thing is after nearly four years of waiting for this top secret startup to show us, you know, what it's going to be doing and when we can actually get a hands on it, we found out that they're going to be shipping the device this summer. They've said they're actually bringing it out. And we've been waiting for that since uh, 2014, I think. In addition to that, we have some idea of the specs now. It's going to have an NVIDIA Tegra X2 system on chip inside for its processing and graphics. And we got to see a demo of it in action. Not a live demo, mind you, but something pre-recorded and something that uh, wasn't all that impressive, honestly, compared to some of the other things we've seen. But, <laughs> Yeah, it felt, it felt very much, I mean, I'm trying, as I watch it, I have to try and remind myself, like, things probably look different when you actually have the goggle on and you're looking at your real space with the superimposed thing floating over the top of it. It's maybe not, you know, 100 percent, you know, uh, as sharp around the edges as it seems like on these videos, which are kind of like, more or less, they're, they're simulated of, of what you would see, but they're not going to match the same aesthetic. It's really important. It's really, really important for these mixed reality devices. I've talked to developers of uh, AR, VR, and mixed reality headsets, and they hate, really, really hate showing these things off over the internet. Yeah. They really want to show them to you in person uh, because, for one thing, I mean, you're looking at a flat screen, and no matter what the graphics might look like on this flat screen, you're going to be seeing them, first off, in 3D. They're going to feel like they are a certain distance away from you. No matter how cheap a VR or AR headset we're talking about, that's kind of there from the get-go. They're in 3D a certain distance away. So this little this little hand that's pinching here, that little uh, rock monster on the couch that you're about to see or something like that, those are going to be um, on your table in your living room. You'll feel like they're there. And apparently the magic with Magic Leap isn't these graphics that we're seeing here. It's that they've figured out some kind of way to make them feel more natural to your eyes than even the other existing VR and air headsets, your Oculus Rift, your HTC Vive, the Google devices. Um, the company has patents, patents dating back several years now um, for research they did to allow you to – to kind of have to avoid this effect you get, um, there's an effect called, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but there's this effect where your eyes, when you're looking at something that's a set distance away from your face, you point your eyes towards each other. There's a convergence so that you see that object. When you look at something right. further away, your eyes tilt out a little bit more. Whereas if you're looking at a VR AR headset, even if you think something is, you know, 20 feet away from you, a mile away from you, your eyes are always looking at this screen right here. And they'd figured out a way to give you different depths, different ways to trick your eyes into doing that rotation more naturally so that you don't have the same kind of fatigue. That's what we've seen in their patents. And that's what we haven't seen in person when you don't see in any of these demos. We don't know if that's the magic behind Magic Leap. Right. If it's going to be so important that if anyone even considers getting this hardware, they absolutely have to put it on their head in order to really understand, in order for the like the universe to open up and they go, oh, now I get it. That's really impossible to show that off online. What we do know about it from from what they've talked about just, just this week is that there's an NVIDIA Tegra X2 processor inside, 64-bit uh, Linux-based OS. What, I mean, as from a specs perspective, what does that allude to? you know, in comparison with anything else that might compete with the Magic Leap? Yeah, the easiest reference is probably uh, smartphones and the Nintendo Switch. If you've got a smartphone today, a high-end smartphone like a Galaxy S9 or your latest iPhone, that has a certain level of performance to it. 
based on an ARM processor of some sort, and it's just about how much faster can they make it in each subsequent generation. And they go up sometimes by 20%, 30% each time. But there is a larger, more powerful variant of these ARM processors that NVIDIA has been pushing for a while now. You find it in set-top boxes, and you find it in the Nintendo Switch. And you've, you've seen the, you know, the gorgeous worlds like Zelda Breath of the Wild on Switch, or if you've seen some of the crazy ports that have been able to do with full PC games like Wolfenstein or Doom, you get some idea. That's a Tegra X1, okay. and this is a Tegra X2. So this is the next step forward there. It's got some extra cores that you don't find in the Tegra X1. They're called Denver cores. It's NVIDIA's own um, ARM processor, basically, cores that they put in there that are supposed to be even more potent but also more power consumption than you find in today's Switch and your phones. So right. this is something that it might get a little hotter, it might consume a little more energy, but you can expect more graphical performance and more processing power there. And of course, you're having the the little puck, the like power puck that it's plugged into. So it's not all entirely contained within the goggles. So that you know, hopefully, alleviates some of the issues that might come yeah. from more power consumption, that sort of stuff. Shouldn't be as much weight in your head because you've yeah. got some of the weight down there. The battery is going to be one of the heaviest components. Uh, processor and the cooling for that processor. That's generally fairly heavy stuff. All that down on your belt instead of up by the glasses. Yeah. And so the question, we, one of the things we want to know, I, I really want to know technically about the system is how, what they are putting up that cable. The theory is that they're using lasers, that they're beaming lasers up fiber optic channels in that cable so that they're kind of, they're kind of that you don't have screens up in those, in that headset, but rather you're actually beaming light at your eyes, which is another thing that could make it feel more natural. But that hasn't been 100% confirmed yet, I don't think. Mm, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm more intrigued than I already was. So so um, one thing that's interesting about this news that we heard is this idea of exclusivity with a carrier. They announced an exclusivity with AT&T as the carrier that would uh, sell their products. And when we're talking about AR and even VR you know, products, that never comes into, <laughs> into the discussion of you know, which, which phone carrier is going to carry it. What does that yeah. seem to say about the hardware that they're well, actually I mean, striking that? At a base level, it says that there's probably going to be cellular connectivity in this I thing, that, yeah. and thus uh, that it might be something you would take around with you into the real world. All yeah. of these mixed reality headsets, um, it's the kind of the idea is that you would want to go out in the real world, like you would with Pokemon Go, for instance, uh, augmented reality games like that, interact with people and see information laid on top of the real world you wouldn't normally. If you're only doing stuff inside your house, you've already got a computer, you've already got a tablet, maybe you got a TV in the house. This is something you can carry around with you. It's wearable, and you need data for that if you want to do anything. So cellular, at start. But the other important thing, very important thing, is this is a brick-and-mortar location everywhere in the country where people can go try yeah. this, see it themselves, which is – tremendous because um, folks who've been pushing VR have had trouble with that. If you want to go try um, uh, an HTC Vive or an Oculus Rift, uh, you could do that in a Microsoft store, but there aren't a lot of Microsoft stores out there. Uh, for a while, uh, they uh, Oculus and Samsung were both pushing in Best Buys, but Oculus had to pull back. They weren't able to make that work there. And I guess you know there was some expense to it. This gives uh, Magic Leap a place where people can see it, try it, not just on a 2D screen, get a real idea if there's some magic in Magic Leap. And for AT&T, the exclusivity means they've got a hot new reason for people to walk in the door in the first place and sell them on a new phone. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Maybe when you buy your next iPhone, you'll get a Magic Leap at half off. Uh, that might be a little ways down the way, but uh, you never know. They might have some bundle deal or something like that. Uh, after all of this hype, we're four years in almost uh, but I mean, even the almost is kind of ridiculous. Four years is a very long time for a product that's never been released to be this hyped. Uh, what do you think? Particularly a product that's raised like two point three billion dollars yeah, or something like that. It's point. it's kind of crazy that that both of those facts are true. Uh, but yet here we are. Do you think it can possibly live up to the expectations? Are you excited about this um, more you know, now uh, versus you know before this news? What do you think? I don't know if anything can live up to those expectations. <laughs> it might very well be that Magic Leap does wonderful things. It might be that a lot of, you know, a lot of devices end up doing this. But uh, when there's a certain amount of hype for a product, you kind of tend to dismiss it right away. I mean, the iPad. You could say that the Apple's iPad has been a resounding success to some degree, and generally, uh, 
you know, transform what we do with screens that are larger than a phone but smaller than a computer. But um, at first, people were just saying it was a bigger iPhone. Right. Because there was so much hype around it and that people, were, people you know, pointed out the fun thing to point out, which is uh, there's, you know, it's just an upsize of the existing thing. This here looks right now very much like Microsoft's HoloLens. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like it's a substantial step beyond that unless some of the things we've seen in the patent filings turn out to be parts of the actual product. Um, but that doesn't mean it won't go on to do amazing things, uh, particularly if they're the ones that just – like Apple often does, that they just make it work. Because if you just put the thing on and, you're, and you say, wow, now I can interact with another layer of reality that maybe I could have done before but was hard, involved having to figure out how to download all kinds of apps and have just the right piece of hardware and you know, build partnerships with all kinds of folks. If they make that work and they have so much talent and so much money behind them, then maybe they're a big freaking deal. Yeah, maybe there's something to be excited about. Sean Hollister with CNET, really appreciate you taking time. Uh, I know it was kind of uh, it was a pinch today, and I really appreciate that. Uh, tell people where you can where they can follow your work online. Yeah, uh, on Twitter I'm at Starfire two two five eight, and I'm at CNET dot com. Right on, my Sean. Articles are. Appreciate Thanks it, so man. Much. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Take care.